Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I am Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This show is brought to you by ShareFile. Check it out. If you want to send secure documents, you want to collaborate, this is an awesome system. In fact, you know, with cybersecurity and everything the way it is, we have so much information in the commercial real estate industry that really is should be protected. Check it out. We use it at Bull Realty. It's called ShareFile. And it's, you can re find out more, learn more at sharefile.com. Well, this is one of my most exciting shows every year. As uh, listeners to the show and viewers know, each year we cover some of the major uh, uh, forecasts I put out. And one of the biggest ones and nicest ones is Emerging Trends in Real Estate. Uh, and it's put out by uh, PwC and ULI. And it provides an outlook on real estate investment, development trends, real estate finance, capital markets, you know, and also touches on property sectors, uh, hot metropolitan areas, and really other issues involving commercial real estate around the U.S. and Canada. And look, that's what we're always trying to, to figure out, right? What's next? What's around the corner? How do we plan? What do we do? Well, let's find out. Please welcome my guest. It's Andrew Alperst Alperstein, and he's a partner with PwC's Financial Markets and Real Estate Group. Andrew, good to see you again. Hey, Michael. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you. And the Emerging Trends 2025, tell me how you guys uh, put this together, and you've been doing it for 46 years? That's right. Well, I haven't been doing it for 46 <laughs> years, but we have. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Michael, it's a combination of about 1,500 survey responses that we get across the industry. Uh, and then we supplement that with uh, somewhere around 500 folks that we interview. So it's a combination of some quantitative feedback um, through the surveys and then a lot of discussion um, uh, from market participants through through the interview process. And we do that jointly with ULI, obviously. So it's a collaborative effort. Yeah. Well, it's a great report and I always appreciate it, uh, access to it uh, each year and talking to you guys about it, some of the highlights. And one of the themes I see here, which is exciting to me, is the time has come. Well, tell us about that, Andrew. Yeah, interesting. You know, we... Um, we, we, we noted a very um, clear change in sentiment, both in terms of how the survey respondents uh, ranked their kind of sentiment as they looked uh, into 2025, but also based on the discussions we had with, uh, with those we interviewed. And, and as you look in the publication, you'll see some of the, the sentiment rankings that we have have clearly improved from uh, our 2023 and 2024 versions um, and so that is a really nice positive trend as we head into, head into 2025. I would also add that if you compare where we are for 2025, it's, it's not quite at the levels we were at pre-COVID. So what that would suggest is, yes, we feel like we're turning a little bit of a corner in terms of sentiment, um, but we're not qu quite as bullish as we were um, you know, in the kind of pre-COVID timeframes. And so there's definitely still some caution out there. Um, but as we've seen the Fed um, cut rates and as, as we've seen a little bit more transaction activity and the capital markets opening up a bit, um, we felt like, you know, the time has come was an appropriate um, way to frame the publication this year. Yeah, well, I like it. And I remember a few years ago, people had a saying of survive till 25 and I was like, right. no, that's terrible. That's terrible. I'm going to do, I'm going to get, do a lot of transactions between now and then. And now I look at it, I'm like, yeah, well, it was probably correct. That's right. That's right. Um, one of the things that you, that you have in the publication on, on trend one under the time has come is be careful what you wish for. What's that about? Yeah, look, I think um, we, we in the industry got pretty comfortable with very low interest rates for a long period of time. Um, debt was widely available and a lot of money was made through um through a, a, a almost historically low interest rate environment and and part of what we try and share in the publication is that we're entering a period where although rates have come down a bit we're still going to be in an environment where um you know rates are going to be higher than they have been in in kind of those recent times so i think that we, we we're, we're sharing a little bit of the caution around the fact that um, this is this is unlikely to be a period of, you know, rates as low as they were, 
and and so a lot of the burden is going to be on market participants to make money through asset selection, through property and asset management, um, and less so from you know a reduction to historically low levels of interest rates and cap rates. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess if rates were really as low as, as they were, then we uh, we must have a problem in the economy, right? That's right. And 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 look, it's interesting. We did a lot of the survey and 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 in, interview work over the summer, late summer, um, and clearly we've seen you know in the last kind of four or five weeks that the ten year treasury you know up seventy five basis points or so, and um, the the volatility that we've seen from the economic indicators has also been something that has been on on folks' minds. And as we went through the interviews, that was um, that was very apparent that uh, folks were looking for a little bit more stability in terms of the rate environment, in terms of Fed behavior, uh, in terms of transaction activity and pricing. And I think the hope is that we're going to see more of that as we head into 2025. Yeah, well, that'd be good news. Then trend two, I see, is a new cycle begins. So we're we're, st- we're starting a, a better trend here. I hope a better cycle. Yeah, look, I think we've we've had a couple of tough years in terms of uh, transaction activity. You know, a big part a big part of the publication has focused on uh, what are primary concerns for market participants, and one of those was availability of debt and the cost of debt. Um, and we've started to see that shift where there is more debt available. Um, the costs are not as cheap as they were, but at least we're starting to see debt be available and that will hopefully, you know, allow for this new cycle to continue to gain momentum. Um, it's been clear to us from the interviews and looking at the data that, uh, transaction activity has started to pick up, um, and that, you know, with increased accessibility to, um, debt capital, we hope that that will, uh, continue uh, into 2025 and beyond, really, given there is a significant amount of of capital that is sitting on the sidelines, has been waiting patiently, uh, and will be looking for opportunities to deploy um, over the coming years. Yeah. Well, was there a, a, a general consensus from the trends that were potentially, if you look at the market overall, uh, at, at the bottom of the market? Well, uh, no question. I think for most property types, uh, the view is that we have we've we're, we're either at that point or pretty close. I think the one exception, and this will not be a surprise to you, is the office sector, which uh, you know folks are still watching very closely, and and you know we continue to see uh, challenges with certain assets and certain sub markets. It's not as widespread as uh, folks make out. There are assets doing assets and sub markets doing very well, uh, but there is a lot of you know, obsolete office space that's going to need to get worked through. And that that's not a new trend, but that would be the one exception, Michael, in terms of kind of getting closer to that uh, bottom of the market point. Yeah. And you make a good point there. It also depends uh, on the asset uh, and also, you know, the market and, and sub market. Uh, so we certainly see that. Uh, one of my special focuses that I enjoy is selling office building. So I certainly, certainly am seeing that. I'm selling you know, some for fifty-seven dollars a foot, and some for four hundred a foot uh, in the same market. <laughs> That's like, right. That's right. That really, really, uh, that really matters. So, trend three is building boom, tenant boom. Uh, what what's going on there? So we got we get into a little bit of detail on what we've seen around new supply uh, as you go through the different property types, and clearly in the industrial space and the multifamily space, you know, we have seen a good amount of new supply, particularly in the Sun Belt. Uh, and there's going to be a period of time where that will need to get absorbed. Uh, the good news is that, you know, we've seen a real slowdown in new construction and new starts. And a lot of that is because the debt capital markets um, largely shut down to new construction and, and a lot of those deals didn't pencil. But when we talked to folks uh, through the interviews, a lot of the feedback was, look, we've got to keep an eye out for some of this the pace at which some of that new supply gets uh, gets absorbed in in the multifamily and industrial space, and and the view is it will, uh, given some of the tailwinds and the and and the fundamentals around those two property types, uh, but that is something to watch. Uh, retail is a little bit different in that we've had almost no new construction in the retail space, and uh, there's certainly opportunity there to to grow NOI and profitability. And then I think again, office is a little bit of a 
a uh, little bit of an outlier in terms of um, a little bit going the other way where, you know, folks are looking for ways to reposition or repurpose some of those office buildings, um, change uh, uses and things like that. So uh, the trend is really about some of what we're seeing from a new supply perspective and how that's uh, shaping the different property types uh, fundamentals. Yeah. And it is a good time to, to be a tenant, isn't it? Well, th- that's right. Uh, for the first time in a while, you know, particularly on the industrial and the multifamily side, we're seeing tenants uh, having a little bit more sway. Uh, for quite a while now, we've seen, you know, almost unprecedented rent growth in, in both of those property types. And so for the first time in a while, that has slowed a little bit such that, you know, tenants at least have a little bit more um, uh, of the pendulum that way. Yeah, good point. And uh, I think, too, a lot of uh, occupiers, especially in office, really mainly, are getting some incredible opportunities to acquire buildings. We've sold a lot of office properties to to users, to occupiers, and boy, it's a great time for them. Well, yeah, I was just going to add, Michael, I mean, what's so interesting about the office space is if you're looking for top of the market space in some of our you know, CBDs, it's, it's not available um, because there is no new supply in office and a lot of the top of the market space has been taken. Um, and so I think it's going to be very interesting to watch how, uh, you know, the, the, the demand that is there on the office side, to your point, where does it, where, where does it go uh, in terms of, um, you know, does it trickle down to, you know, suburban locations? Does it trickle down to A minus B plus buildings and the CBDs? I think there's a lot we've got to kind of keep an eye on there um, as tenants do look to uh, take take more space or expand, uh, which hasn't happened for you know certainly a couple of years. Yeah. And then you have a sidebar here about uh, demographics. What should we think about there with the emerging trends in real estate report? Sure. We in the publication, we've we've tracked demographic shifts in the U.S. closely uh, over time. Uh, the 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 trend towards the Sun Belt and the the mig- migration we've seen uh, consistently from you know some of the more northern locations and and coastal locations the Sun Belt has been uh, very strong from a trend perspective you know that has slowed down uh, it's continuing but it has slowed down uh, the interesting piece that we weave in this year is is the increasing severity of of weather events and how so much of that is in Sunbelt markets, whether you think about some of the hurricanes we've seen, some of the power and, and other issues we've seen, uh, and some of the flooding and other events that we've seen. Um, so the, there's this interesting um, observation that we have just around that ongoing trend to the Sun Belt for all the reasons that we've talked about in the publication, cost of living, climate, um, jobs, um, and it's, a, you, you know, to a certain extent being offset by uh, an increasing concern around around climate and particularly severe weather events. And we've obviously, unfortunately, seen, you know, we had a pretty bad kind of September, October from that perspective. So uh, from a publication perspective, we're trying to balance those two trends as they become amplified and, and kind of interconnect. Yeah, that makes sense. And and then trend five, I guess, is a, regarding you know housing and affordable housing. And it seems like there's a lot of opportunity and, and, and a lot of challenges there, right? No question. I mean, we heard it. We heard it in the run up to the presidential election. Both kind of candidates talking about housing. Uh, it's it's no secret that the U.S. Um, is you know millions of units short from a housing perspective. Uh, we've obviously seen a run up in in prices of single family homes. Uh, We've seen a desire for particularly families to move uh, to areas with more space as we, as we came out of COVID. Um, And there are very few solutions uh, at scale that look to be out there to solve uh, the severity of, of, of the challenge in front of us. Uh, one of the themes we did here, Michael, just th- particularly through the interviews, was how much of this is dependent on uh, local jurisdictions, you know, local government um, teaming with developers and 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 the private sector to create some of this new supply. 
uh, and 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 the feedback is clear that this is the opportunity here is new supply uh, as opposed to you know um, additional affordability programs we need more units and and I expect that this is a trend that we're going to be paying closer and closer to ten- attention to, uh, particularly as the the size of the the gap kind of continues to expand. Yeah, supply and demand. I, I remember that from from yeah. school, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, I don't do things that would uh, create even more demand. Uh, that's, that's not going to help us. And then um, one of uh, the trends it looks like in here in the sidebar is involving technology. Well, that's right. You know, there's there's so much news around Gen AI, and we're we're very fortunate to get some some folks that contributed to the publication that spent a lot of time in the prop tech space. It's another area that, in almost every interview, we had conversations around what folks are thinking about next from a a prop tech and a Gen AI perspective. There's a long way to go here. Um, everything from you know lease abstraction to different types of tenant experiences in multifamily to different um, uh, opportunities in the hospitality sector. There is so much kind of opportunity here. And, you know, the real estate industry has notoriously been a little slow to move with technology, but I think uh, folks are starting to see some of these opportunities present in a more ROI centric way. And I think we're going to see some pretty fun and exciting use cases uh, as the technology becomes a little bit more, uh, you know, comfortable to folks and and more use cases are developed. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm always updating our technology and I think I'm going to go ahead and get a new fax machine, get one that's a there little you faster. Go. There you go. <laughs> Maybe not one that uses this as a roll paper. <laughs> uh, I was uh, emceeing an event the other day and I was uh, introducing an uh, artificial intelligence speaker. We wrote a book on it and uh, the, one of the somebody in the crowd asked me if I've used artificial intelligence. And I said, absolutely. I've used it for like 35 years. It's always <laughs> been artificial <laughs> intelligence, right. you know, uh, certainly I use it. Um, well, one of the things you, you do is talk about in this report is talk about top markets. Uh, what are some of the, the top markets that uh, are, have, have opportunity you see? So you'll see in the publication, Michael, we we are uh, we've seen a little bit of a waiting again to the Sun Belt uh, between the Texas and the Florida markets. Very uh, well represented. Uh, Dallas was was number one on the list. Um, but what what was maybe more interesting to us was some of the movers that we saw uh, year over year. Um, Manhattan was one that stood out to us. You know. Manhattan had been a little bit of a casualty coming out of COVID and and really we've seen a a pretty nice bounce back, both from a fundamentals perspective, but also the sentiment uh, within the publication. Uh, And there were a number of other markets that um, as you get into it, you'll see some of the markets in the Midwest um, that have had some interesting investment opportunities, good demographic shifts. But ultimately, Michael, the, 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 the waiting is still very much to uh, the Sun Belt, Boston is probably the one outlier from a what you think of as your traditional kind of uh, gateway markets that uh, maintains its spot in the top ten, and that's really a function of you know a little little bit more of a diversified economy and obviously the education educational institutions that they have there. Um, but it, it's always interesting to see the slight pivots year over year in terms of um, where sentiment shifts as we look at. Um, both those my migration and demogra- demographic trends, as well as the feedback we get from from uh, from the survey participants. Were there any shifts in, in top markets uh, re- related to to weather and and flooding and hurricanes and insurance? You know, surprisingly, not as much as we expected. Um, you'll still see a number of the Florida markets. They actually moved up um, in in the rankings, and 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 those are likely the most uh, most impacted. Uh, I, we, particularly in the interview process, had a lot of discussions around how folks are thinking differently if they are around investment selection, property management, asset management, uh, with respect to some of those markets that are becoming, you know, higher and higher risk. Uh, it's something we're watching closely from a publication perspective, but at this point, we didn't see it have a meaningful impact on on uh, how folks shared feedback on 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 their top prospects 
uh, and particularly the top 10. And for you listeners and viewers out there, this report is 133 pages. So this show is going to last five hours. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're, we're just going to hit some of the highlights. We'll put a link to, to the report for you. But uh, it's, it is a, a great, a great publication. Um, well, let's, let's talk about some of the property types and some of the trends there. Uh, industrial, uh, what, what's the, what are some trends there? So we, we, we have seen, obviously, a very strong um, uh, trend of uh, both industrial demand, uh, new supply, plenty of capital. Um, that did slow down in, in the last year or so as, as folks, you know, acknowledged the higher rate environment, the fact that a lot of the, you know, just in case um, capacity had, had, you know, maybe wasn't necessary. Um, and so we've seen a little bit of a moderation in terms of, of rent growth. Uh, we've certainly seen a slowdown uh, in investment activity. Uh, but what was interesting this year was the focus on onshoring, the focus on advanced manufacturing, the focus on how important power is um, to particularly new developments. Those were some uh, topics, Michael, that we hadn't heard as much about in prior years. And I think with kind of deglobalization, a lot of companies bringing uh, manufacturing back on shore, uh, so many more of the technology, so many more of the companies looking to enhance the technology and their worker experience um, in warehouses, in manufacturing facilities. There is a little bit of a pivot that we're seeing um, to some of these newer concepts around uh, what the future of industrial will look like. And so we tried to bring that to bear a little bit in the publication, given, um, you know, we've again, we've come off this trend of of a very, very strong um you know, COVID e-commerce uh, driven um, demand cycle and a little bit of a slowdown. And, and as I think folks are kind of resetting and repositioning, those are some of the trends we were pretty excited to hear about just because they are a little bit more forward looking and some things we hadn't heard as much about, as I said. Yeah. Well, it makes sense uh, that uh, power electric would be a, a concern because, you know, we're, we're, we're gearing ourselves up to, to need more electricity going electric vehicles and, and everything else. Um, uh, and it seems like we've had problems with the, the grids in places already. Um, and That's I right. think we're seeing yep. sometimes the, the lack of electricity slow down, slow down development. And, uh, and then of course that brings us, uh, trends right w well into data centers, which, uh, you cover in the report, right? So that's right. And, and, you know, we, we had thought, you know, the power conversation was focused on, on data centers. It certainly is. And it's one of the absolutely key attributes in terms of uh, the new supply that is, that is needed in the data center space. We probably underestimated how, how its importance, power's importance is influencing more traditional industrial as well, particularly as we think about some of the advanced manufacturing that I mentioned, but on the data center point, you know, so many headlines, so much focus on that sector. Um, you know, a lot of focus on, um, you know, the, the, the demand side is, is very clear. And you've got a number of, you know, very large tenants that are looking for uh, an increasing amount of kind of capacity, um, not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, there's limited new supply. Uh, limited locations for that new supply. And so there's, there's really a huge opportunity for folks that can identify uh, and obtain the right sites, get the right kind of infrastructure and zoning in place, make sure they have the power connections. Um, the tenants are there. It's a little bit more about some of those other factors that um, folks are, are so focused on. Uh, I do think that the interesting point about data centers, Michael, is that there's definitely a, a cohort of folks we, we speak to that are you know, huge believers and are in the space and investing in the space. There's another cohort who say, this is feels a little bit different to other property types. There's a lot of unknowns in terms of what does the technology look like in 10 or 15 years? Um, is this more infrastructure than real estate? Is it more digital asset than real estate? Um, what is what is very clear is that the demand drivers are there and and with the, you know, the continuing focus on Gen AI and, and data and storage, this is a space that's going to certainly in the short term be um, very lucrative um, 
and and so we felt it was important to you know bubble some of those um some of those feedback points uh into the publication yeah and they're certainly uh costly <laughs> to put together right no no question no question um and and then you cover in chapter two uh trends on senior housing and uh, what'd you see there well, senior, the senior space is interesting. You know, seniors were heavily impacted during COVID. Uh, a lot of challenges during the COVID um, years with with the senior housing space. You know, what what we've observed, and a lot of this came through in in some of the interview conversations, is that the the demographic trends are really clear in terms of the aging population and the needs around senior housing. Um, what, what is a little bit more interesting is is kind of the supply side. Um, we've got we've got a number of developers that are developing at the high end of the market um, in you know inner urban or suburban areas that um, you know are largely private pay type um, uh, properties that that are doing very well and leasing is strong. Uh, we've got a kind of lower end of the market that's a little bit more affordability based. There are some government subsidies and things like that. <clears throat> And, and that part of the market does uh, perform as well as well. But there's this massive uh, middle market opportunity that really isn't being addressed. Um, and some of that is it doesn't pencil out from a development perspective. Um, and we haven't seen a lot of uh, interest yet in um, trying to solve that, that kind of middle market uh, challenge. And it's, it's not dissimilar from the broader affordability um, discussion that we had, but we felt like it was important as we come out of COVID and some of the operational items start to stable, stabilize in the senior living space, that we start to focus a little bit more on the supply demand uh, discussion and and it's exacerbated by kind of the aging of the U.S. population and, and the lack of kind of product, an affordable product to match that that need. So another really kind of interesting and important trend for us to watch. Yeah. And it's certainly, a, if you look at it as a commercial real estate type, it's certainly a very involved uh, business, right? That's right. More, more, oper uh, more operationally intensive. There's regulatory and compliance uh, items too, but um, there is definitely a need there. And, and, and so we felt, again, it was important uh, as we see the landscape shift a little bit outside of COVID that we, we uh, highlighted that for our readers. Yeah. So uh, I was looking at an analysis on an apartment deal we were, we were selling, and you know the the underwriting was like seven or eight pages. And so I'm looking at a, a senior housing analysis at our senior housing group, and it's like 48 pages. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> what the? There's a lot going on here. That's right, a lot of complexity. And then we've seen uh, those uh, properties uh, wasn't a lot of transactions for a while, but now we're we're seeing it, it pick up again. So. That's an interesting property type. And then uh, and another interesting one, because it seems to have been doing so well, is, is retail. But then you know, we do hear of, of situations with, with some uh, retailers, you know, going bankrupt or closing closing stores, right? There, there is a little bit of a mixed uh, story there, Michael, you're right. But I think the overall sentiment is, is much more positive around retail. Uh, as you as you well know, we, we had some tough years in the retail sector as we had a lot of kind of obsolete mall space. Uh, you know, the large majority of that has been released, repositioned. That's almost um, you know well in the rearview mirror. Uh, wh what is so fascinating now is um, how strong the fundamentals around uh, retail are with respect to limited new supply, um, almost historically low levels of of vacancy in many markets around the U.S. Um, good NOI growth, um, good kind of net absorption. Um, so the fundamentals look really good. To your point, there have been, uh, you know, some bankruptcies and, and, and closures. At the same time, if you look at uh, fitness and some of the restaurant chains and some of the experiential real uh, retail, um, some of the discount uh, retailers, there is net positive growth in stores. And I think there's a little bit of a shift happening between the types of retailers that are succeeding versus those that aren't. But net net um we're hearing a lot we're hearing a lot more positivity around that property type and we think that that will be one of the places that capital will be deployed um as we get into hopefully a more robust transaction market uh particularly as folks 
have been most likely under allocated to retail um, coming off some of those um, those tougher years with with some of the mall kind of casualties. Yeah. Well, it does seem like retail's um, adjusted pretty well to the online sales and, and, and the growth there, hasn't it? It's, real, it's really stabilized. No question that the, the kind of combination of in-store experience with, um, you know, the online um, experience is, has become kind of a, a success story for a lot of retailers where it's it's that combination of both that's giving them, um, you know, momentum and, and is proving to be very successful. Yeah. Well, we're covering uh, highlights from uh, PwC's uh, Merging Trends in Real Estate done with uh, ULI. And uh, Andrew, one of the... Uh, uh, property types you talk about that everyone has interest in is uh, multifamily. Uh, what are the trends you guys cover there? Well, you know, you and I touched uh, earlier on on the affordability point and the number of uh, number of units that the U.S. is is likely short. So, the 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 fundamentals in multifamily look um, look really strong. Uh, we've still got you know low vacancy levels in in most in most markets in the country. We obviously did have uh, an elevated level of new supply, particularly in the Sun Belt, um, particularly in some of our higher ranked markets, to be to be transparent. Um, but a lot of that was driven by um, the same uh, kind of tailwinds and, and, and driving forces that we're seeing uh, in terms of the migration, uh, job growth uh, in some of the Sun Belt markets. So, uh, we're seeing a little bit of slowdown in multifamily. We talk about that in the publication, but the view, both from the survey and and interviews, is 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 consistent around the the, the medium and long term fundamentals very strong, uh, particularly as folks struggle um, from a, a a home ownership perspective. Just given the increasing prices of home ownership, higher mortgage rates, down payment requirements. Um, the expectation is multifamily will continue to be uh, will continue to be strong into the future. And again, as folks look for opportunities uh, into twenty twenty five, we're we're already seeing the multifamily space being popular from a transaction activity perspective as we're kind of wrapping up twenty twenty four. Yeah, you know, and you think about the kind of the share shared economy. Yeah, you know, we're all more comfortable sharing things you know andrew would you'd have thought 20 years ago that you and i you and i were getting a five year year old toyota and, and riding the back seat with someone we don't know, <laughs> you know? Oh, a, a, absolutely michael it's uh these are some of the fascinating trends and i think um you know i i also think multifamily is the one space going back to our discussion on prop tech we're going to see more and more evolution with you know the multifamily tenant being a lot more um, connected to the experience through technology, whether it's uh, ordering services, uh, maintenance, things like that. And I think on the property and asset management, there's a lot that's been done already in terms of reducing cost, making the tenant experience better. So it's a fun sector to watch um, across the U.S. Yeah. And I think it's uh, it's no longer uh, taboo. You know, if, uh, if I ask someone, you know, 20 years ago, and they said they rent an apartment. I'm like, oh, poor thing. I feel sorry for you. And, and now you, you ask me, they live in an apartment, and you go, you lucky dog. So you can do whatever you want this weekend. <laughs> That's right. And they're certainly a lot nicer. Um, well, let's talk about hospitality, uh, hotels. What's going on there? You know, it's it's an interesting space, Michael. We, we came out of COVID. If you remember, you know, the hospitality mar- uh, sector was, was probably the most impacted at the outset of COVID, um, the view was it was going to take many years to return to kind of pre-COVID levels. As we all saw, there was an enormous amount of um, uh, revenge travel was was the phrase that was used, and a, a lot of that was uh, was the was the regular traveler, right, going to Europe and and visiting parts of the U.S. Um, the leisure traveler traveler really uh, came back in a strong way. Uh, we saw a slight upt- uptick in the corporate <clears throat> um, corporate traveler, but that has slowed down a bit as companies have have, have looked at cost, and and certainly the the leisure traveler has pulled back a little bit um, as well as the economy has has slowed a little bit. So you know the hotel sector is a little bit more watchful from a from an operations perspective. I think the bounce back was 
again quicker than than most thought and now we're into a little bit more of a stabilization stage uh our expectation is that we will see uh transaction activity in the hospitality space um the yields cap rates are are higher than other property types and um there are a number of um you know strong markets and strong properties that are going to do extremely well so a lot to kind of keep an eye on there. Another property type, Michael, as well, that's going to be heavily influenced by data, Gen AI, um, and an improving customer experience. Um, so some exciting things to watch in that sector as well. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit more uh, about uh, AI and, and hotels. Uh, what, what, what's the trend you're seeing there? You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot happening um, at the front desk, you know, in terms of check-in and the data that that the hotel companies have about guests. And I think that's certainly just a way to, to improve the experience. And then, you know, there's the in-room experience, which is uh, becoming more and more automated. And I think as, as folks figure out how to better um, navigate the data that they have, we're going to see more interesting um, opportunities in terms of preference, in terms of um, the ease of your experience. So, the hospitality sector is probably the furthest along, quite frankly, in terms of looking for use cases because they are so, you know, day to day customer centric and they do have so much data with so many different guests coming through their hotels. So, uh, again, a pretty fun sector to watch from that perspective, um, uh, particularly as, you know, we rely more and more on our mobile devices and that becomes kind of an interplay with uh, the experience that you have in a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, one of the uh, sectors you guys covered was student housing. Uh, what, what's the trends there? Well, the, the student space is, is interesting because a lot of folks um, have resonated to that space because, number one, it, it, it has a lot of the same characteristics as multifamily and, and, and the housing um, needs that we have. Um, obviously, it's a slightly di different uh, demographic in, t in terms of the student intake and each kind of university, whether it's on campus or off campus has, has slightly different dynamics. Uh, what has been attractive, particularly to investors has been a, a slightly higher premium that can be obtained in, in a lot of student housing deals. So that was a big driver for, for some of the investment, uh, appetite, but overall we see, and you'll see it in, in some of the uh, property type prospects. The weighting towards housing is very clear, um, whether it's student, whether it's uh, traditional multifamily, uh, whether it's single family rental, there's a huge amount of focus and optimism around housing as a sector. And I think the student housing story plays into that just with a slightly different spin and, 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 and kind of opportunity for folks um, to diversify their product a little bit um, and at a slightly higher yield. Yeah. And speaking of housing, we were selling a, a self storage property. Uh, we we're closing the other day, and uh, there was someone actually living in one of the units. units. And that's not right. But uh, tell us what are, I hope that's not the trend for uh, self storage. What did you guys we see? Did, there? We did not hear that trend, fortunately, Good. Michael. But, Good. um, you know, we've seen self storage is certainly another one of those alternative property types that have become uh, a, lo a lot more institutionally accepted. When you think about student housing, self-storage, <clears throat> data centers, manufactured housing, um, coming out of COVID, those all became uh, much more accepted from an institutional perspective. Uh, the the self-storage space is interesting to watch because there has been a good about a good amount of new supply. Uh, what's so interesting about the property type is that tenants are extremely sticky. Once they have their, you know, um, their items in a storage locker, they're they're pretty unlikely to, to leave. Um, so it's a great business model from that perspective. I think the point to watch and we highlighted in the publication is, is that balance of supply demand. And, and, and certainly the supply side has been a little bit elevated, um, particularly in some of the, again, Sunbelt markets where there was a good amount of uh, new construction. Uh, and so we'll be watching closely to see how that new supply gets absorbed. What does that do from a rental rate perspective? Um, and do we start to see a little bit of softness maybe um, as some of that absorption starts to maybe take a little bit longer? Um, but I think longer term, this is another one of those alternative property types that investors have become very comfortable slotting into their 
uh, diversified uh, portfolios. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to have more self-storage listings. They, they seem to sell like hot cakes and it, it cap rates that are just lower than, than, than sometimes that we, we even expect. And, and speaking of smaller sectors and even smaller sector is a medical office. Uh, what are some trends there? Well, medicals had a, had a pretty good run. And I think uh, when you talk to folks that are in the space, they, they want to differentiate themselves from the traditional office space. Uh, they certainly have different drivers. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we've seen uh, consistent with self-storage, medical office being another alternative property type that folks have have looked to to diversify their portfolios, again, with, um, with a bit more yield. Uh, there is a lot more focus in medical office on location, the tenancy, you know, being closer to hospitals or having, you know, stickier tenants that have dependencies on hospitals and, and hospital systems um, makes the underwriting and, and portfolio and asset management that, that much more important. But once again, you know, these are property types that maybe 10 years ago, we didn't really talk about very much. And now they're becoming much more uh, front and center with our, uh, with our, uh, serve the folks that we survey, the interviews, and, and, and just generally in the sector, we're seeing a lot more uh, kind of comfortableness with these alternative property types as they become more institutional, more data points, um, and the like. Yeah. Yeah, I like the space. It, it's certainly small compared to office. It's <coughs> almost tiny compared to office, but uh, we certainly get see really uh, low cap rates uh, uh, compared to office. And, uh, and to your point, uh, very sticky uh, tenants that uh, don't seem to want to move around much, right? That's right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's wrap it up here, Andrew. When you think about the report, uh, what kind of jumps out at you that, uh, that maybe surprised you or you think the listeners would want to know about? Well, I, 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 going back to where we started the conversation, Michael, we were encouraged with the shift in sentiment. I think we um, we were hopeful that that's what we would see after you know two or so years of maybe three years of um, you know a little bit of of pessimism. Um, and so we were we were we were happy to see the the turnaround in that trend. Um, I think the other. The other pieces that we were a little bit surprised at was, um, you know, you and I talked about some of the property types that are um, have some different drivers. We talked about retail. We talked about storage. <clears throat> um, we talked a little bit about senior housing. There's some interesting property type specifics that I think are interesting to watch. And then as we touched on some of the uh, geographic markets and some of the trends around migration um, are always interesting to see how the migration trends line up relative to sentiment. And I think, you know, we always enjoy um, getting some of the survey responses back, understanding um, how the market is thinking about some of these uh, locations and seeing how it lines up, um, you know, with uh, with some of the data and, and transaction activity and things like that. Yeah. And I guess the, the sentiment about uh, office was just still pr pretty negative, right? Yeah, you'll you'll see. We we didn't uh, we we didn't have a huge trend around office because, from our perspective, it's not really something that's particularly new, and and we're in a kind of a prolonged period of working through a lot of kind of obsolete office space. And um, you know, to us, there wasn't a lot of you know newness to that trend. I think there's certainly things to watch and sub markets to watch, and we talked about some of the top of the market tenants, but. Um, you know, it is an important part of uh, many folks' of portfolios. We're going to see some interesting transactions. Uh, but as we thought about what are the more kind of provocative trends, what are some of the things that we want to highlight um, that wasn't as high on the list as it's been in prior years? Yeah, well, that makes sense. And, uh, you know, I've been in this business a long time and I've seen the major wealth created uh, by contrarian investors. And, uh, you know, if you have the stomach for it, uh, office might be uh, the way to go right now, especially if it's in the Sun Belt or, you know, market that's, that should experience continued growth because new supply is going to stop. Some buildings get torn down, some converted, uh, more back to office started and you know, gradually keeps happening. So uh, I'm real bullish. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, wealth created in uh, by folks who buy office in 2025 and, and especially the trend on those occupiers who can, you know, 
fill some of the void in, in those spaces, right? No question. Yeah. No question. <clears throat> well, fi- final comment, Andrew, uh, on emerging trends in real estate 2025. Well, firstly, I wanted to, um, you did make the point that we're 130 pages. We do have a digital version this year. So Michael will make sure your readers get the digital version. They can look at it on their smartphones. Hopefully it's a little bit more dynamic. Um, we'd like to thank all the folks that that obviously participated and our, and our partners, ULI. <clears throat> but again, I think that that shift in sentiment, I think was so important to kind of corroborate and, and tell that story because uh, we have had a slow period of time here and, and we're excited about 2025. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of the folks that we talked to had that same sentiment. And so uh, we were happy to share it to be, uh, to be clear. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm here doing the Snoopy dance. So you guys that are just listening, I'm doing a stupid dance. So yeah, I'm excited too. And we, we see it here, we have more activity on our assignments and more sellers uh, trust in the market and, and more buyers and, and, uh, and lenders uh, trust in their underwriting and uh, thing. And, and as your point earlier, a, a lot of dry powder kind of waiting for, for this time. So uh, I believe in it. I'm, I appreciate it. Thanks for being on the show, Andrew. Thanks for having us, Michael. Good to see you. All right. You too. And, and thank you for joining us around the country. Uh, please let us know what you think. We'll have a link uh, to the report at CREshow.com. And uh, hey, let us know if you have any questions, ideas, thoughts. Uh, you reach out to me if you like for anything, if you need a referral or anything to anybody in the country for any commercial real estate related service. My email is an easy one. It's Michael at BullRealty.com. And until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty, commercial real estate sales, leasing, and advisory services. Visit bullrealty.com or reach out to me directly. My email is michael at bullrealty.com. By ShareFile, designed with real estate and other highly regulated industries in mind, ShareFile offers secure digital solution to simplify workflow and improve collaboration. Visit ShareFile.com. By Commercial Agent Success Strategies, 21 cloud accessed agent training videos. Learn more at CommercialAgentSuccess.com. You're invited to subscribe to the show wherever you listen or watch the show. You're also invited to subscribe to a weekly email announcing the show topic and guests at CREshow.com. Thank you for watching, listening, and sharing America's commercial real estate show.